Hello and thank you for watching. My name is Don Eindhoven and I am the founder of the Dutch Cyber Warfare Community. You are watching clips recorded from our 22nd Roundtable event held on December 3rd, 2020. We call it the Corona Edition. Our final speaker of the evening was Win Schwatau. Win Schwatau was most likely the very first person to openly speak out about the threat of what we now call cyber warfare. He pioneered this topic in the 90s and wrote several books about it, such as Information Warfare, Chaos on the Electronic Superhighway in 1994, and his follow-up, Information Warfare, Cyber Terrorism, Protecting Your Personal Security in the Electronic Age in 1996. Since then, he's written a considerable amount of books, such as PearlHarbor.com, Terminal Compromise, Cyber Safety and Ethics and Stuff, and of course, his latest work, Analog Network Security, in which he puts his knowledge as both a security and audio engineer to good use, going into security concepts that we haven't applied yet, but should, such as using the concept of time in securing things. Aside from authoring books, Wynn is also an avid public speaker, covering just about every security topic under the sun at all major conferences, such as Hacker Halted, RSA, you name it. You might have also heard of his firm, The Security Awareness Company. Wynn is a longtime friend of the proverbial show here at the Dutch Cyber Warfare Community, and we are very fortunate to have had him with us here at this roundtable event. Ladies and gentlemen, Wynn Schwartau. So now it's on to our last speaker of the evening. And boy, it's, it's been an evening and everything has gone so incredibly well, uh, way beyond all of my expectations. Uh, our next and final speaker is Wynn Schwartau, uh, the chief visionary office at the uh, uh, security awareness company that he sold financially handsome to, to the No Before company. Uh, I, I think you're still in there, right? are you Wynn? Um, I'm, I am the CBO of this research division, yes. What, uh, I think you, you were talking about cyber warfare before anyone even used the term. It was in the 80s or 90s, or was it? You were one of um, it was roughly 88. I had been in security from 83, and then the whole uh, cyber war IW thing began. I, I, I'm doing a... a Bill Hutchinson out of uh, Edith Cowan University is doing the 20th annual issue of the International Journal of Information Warfare, and I'm writing the, uh, the historical perspective of it and sort of a memoir of what my experiences were uh, in the last 30 years. And so it's it's sort of more personal than technical, but yeah, I've been at this a long damn time. <laughs> so is that is that your next book? Is that what you're saying, basically, when or? Oh, I I don't think I have another book in me right now. Um, I'm <laughs> I'm working on so many projects <laughs> that um, no, I, I'm I'm busy enough right now. Thank you. I just missed some travel. I wish I were overseas and over there right now and have a glass of wine and making Richard have more than one. <laughs> now you're referring to our Paris adventure where I, where I ended up guiding someone to the local hospital to think to, to consider whether he had a, a serious concussion. It turns out he had downed a bo two full bottles of wine before we saw what he was doing. And uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I felt really bad for him and uh, that, that was an awkward <laughs> evening. <laughs> But Miami was a lot of fun as well because um, that's where I did not, despite your pressure, I did not get an autograph. Oh, you didn't? I you were there. You sent me over to get her autograph at the other table. No, I didn't. You did that, and then you blamed it on me when she said. I know it wasn't me. It was you said go over, be nice. She's gonna be fine. She'll get. And it was like, oh, geez, thanks, Don. I'm pretty sure that what I said was. When please don't do that. She's trying to have her baby. <laughs> we, we remember that evening very differently. Yes, yeah. I'm sure he did. For reference, we were sitting in a restaurant, and the female lead of what was it called that TV show about spies? Um, be be listed. No, burn, burn, burn. The burn notice. Burn notice. Thank you. Burn notice. And uh, the the fiery female lead was having dinner there. Yeah, that's what we're referring to. Don sent me over to get her autograph. 
Epic fail. I, I Epic. I'm going to move on to this. People don't give a crap about this. All right, I'm going to get through this kind of quickly because – I'm sorry, Don, what? I will give you the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, oh. we have recording. Win Schwartel. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks. I'm sorry for everything running late. I'll do this as quick as I can. Um, I've been at this a long damn time, and I've really come to the conclusion uh, that cybersecurity is a subset of cyber war, is a subset of info war. And in the last 30 years, I don't think one whole hell of a lot has really changed. Um, back in those days, that was where we had an awful lot of the novel thinking, repositioning, shifting domains, and some of the things that were discussed earlier, uh, state-private defense of critical infrastructures. Uh, the, these discussions are still occurring because uh, we didn't do a whole really good job at policy making 30 years ago when these same types of things uh, were being discussed at various levels uh, throughout the government and the private sector. Uh, we had disruptive stuff going on back in those days, and we've had an awful lot of disruptions as well that have changed the face of what I refer to as anthro-cyber kinetic conflict. Now, there's three domains, the human domain, the cyber domain, and the physical domain, and to look at any one of them all by itself uh, is going to be completely self-defeating. It's a, an integrated uh, environment that we're dealing with. Again, we talked about this 30 years ago, and I still see so much damn stove piping going on. And uh, I miss some of the strategic views, uh, the strategic crazies, uh, ideas that uh, were discussed back in those days and for work on a lot of other similar events uh, around the world. And we never really grasp the whole totality of this issue, in my opinion, and we're still treated as shrapnel uh, types of environments. And I have a real problem with that, especially with what is going to be coming up uh, in the future. So right now, uh, if we chose to, uh, we could actually uh, start improving our position by Getting people better educated, more interdisciplinary types of studies. I talk to firewall guys, and then I go into neuroscience of people's behaviors of binary conditions, and the conversation doesn't really translate. Uh, it's my belief that we don't teach enough of the interdisciplinary basics. I don't want people to become neuroscientists or become engineers or become any of these things that I'm listing here. But I do think that some degree of fluency and conversational ability and ability then to research a little bit more to understand how all of these things have now become totally tied together and uh, the offense and defense are going to be changing, whether it's at the criminal level, uh, class two info war, class one privacy uh, criminals, uh, criminal endeavors with identity tests and all of that or all the way up to class three nation state and NGO types of conflicts. Uh, we have forgotten to teach folks that this is about humanity and that to integrate thinking about who the players are and how they interface with the technology is something that we have missed. And uh, unfortunately, I think that it's going to make things even worse as we can carry along. So, we've talked, uh, I know I've talked about hiring the unhirable. There are so many people out there that have very, very unique skills that have not been optimized or integrated into these environments for uh, social structure or uh, uh, discrimination. Very, very arbitrary. Same reason I couldn't get a job in the 70s because I'm colorblind, so I had to take another route. And then we have ageism, of course, and uh, I fit into that group that uh, when people are moving up in the organization, moving out, getting into retirement age, uh, we tend to have a closed door. Uh, view of things uh, versus treating them as valued assets to be consulted with. And so we have to really refigure, uh, especially with what's going to be coming up in the future, how we're going to have our defensive forces and some of our offenses, uh, offensive forces trained. Um, fundamentally, I, I think we understand the mathematics behind uh, cyber defense, whether it's InfoWar, Kinetic or not, and it's applying John Boyd's type of principles back from 1984, 
with the concept of time-based detection and depth. We understand the mathematics, and it's basically whoever's going to be the fastest wins. That was true with Boyd's work when he was talking about and developing uh, the concept of OODA for dogfighting and aerial combat. He who gets inside the adversary's decision loop, and he does it faster, will win. If you don't, you lose. And some of the graphics that are associated with this and some of the math here, um, if you're interested, uh, I'll be happy to send it to you. Uh, this is now proven. Now it's a matter of really starting to apply it. So we have some basics. We have some problems. But what I've been thinking about is what is the next major transformation? What's the next major disruptive thing that's going to occur? Uh, we've talked about the cybers and their wireless cybers and all of the bits and technological pieces. Uh, we've talked about uh, over the years some NBC combined nuclear biological chemical combinations, the kinetic uh, effects on the infrastructure, on the human population, the social aspects of that. But something else is going to change, and it's going to change in such a way that we're going to have to do a, a real rethink of this entire area of conflict. And this is looking at post-human and transhuman societies. And this means a lot of different things to different groups. And ultimately, uh, you could take the Kurzweilian view and say, okay, we're going to upload the mind into a machine and then oh, all these things are going to happen. We're going to have enhanced humans. We're going to have uh, full avatars in uh, 3D in the virtual world and then ultimately in the physical world. As we start to integrate, the carbon units and silicon units together, and we have alleged AI, and I don't believe in AI at all, it's a different argument entirely, but as these systems are going to start to collide and integrate, what is going to be the emergent phenomena that we're going to have to deal with with regards to the players, the users, the soldiers, the cyber warriors, the political leaders, the military leaders, as we as society start getting plugged into the post-humanism events, and it is going to happen, whether it's in five years or by 2050, this integration is occurring. And this is going to fundamentally change how the players are going to integrate with whatever we have decided to up to that point. Do we buy into the time-based due to loop operations for current types of cyber war offense and defense? Okay. Uh, if Do we buy into detection and depth? Okay, because that helps with predicting the future. How do we uh, tie all these things together into a post-humanist society? I don't begin to have the answers. Uh, I don't play a lot in InfoWar anymore, as many of you know. And then Don asked me to come up with something that I've been thinking about, and this is it. And we've seen this before. Uh, we saw it was referenced earlier, uh, Russian thinking about IW. Back in the 90s, I used to, when I was playing over there, yeah, they were thinking about IW completely. We're, we're thinking tech. They're thinking mind. Uh, the Chinese, they were the only country in the world to actually license the book Information Warfare and start using some of the playbooks in it. And uh, they did it legally back in the 90s, and they followed some of the ideas. Uh, Ron Ewart's work on mapping, the critical infrastructure mapping of the planet was something that was absolutely critical to be uh, create both defensive understanding and offensive capabilities. We've been there. We've seen these things. But we weren't prepared or willing as a society to accept that we got to deal with this stuff as it's moving on. And it, that's why things haven't changed a whole hell of a lot. And as we look at silicon uh, carbon hybridization, whether it is a hard tech, whether it's soft tech, and probably some combination of the two, this is going to change the playing field and the environments in ways that we cannot possibly comprehend. And I'm going to end my sharing. And thank you if anybody is actually still here. No, it's just us. <laughs> <laughs> No man, I mean uh, for for the uh, for the crowd, uh, uh, much of what you've shown uh, is from your book Analog Security, uh, which, uh, by the way, is great and not nearly as uh, as uh, as challenging as uh, as it might appear with all the mathematical formulas and stuff like that. Um, 
maybe you want to briefly illustrate, you know, your your past because you were an audio engineer. Is that what is that right? Um, I grew up in the music business. My father produced Dylan, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and all that. My mother was the first female audio engineer at NBC during the war. I grew up in that world, uh, became a recording engineer uh, at 16, started building recording studios, and then uh, TV, movies, what have you, and then um, uh, did some production work, totally burned out, and said, I'm going to go do computer security. Yeah, yeah. Now, <laughs> that's not a field with burnouts at all. <laughs> so, no, I mean, uh, for reference, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, uh, um, basically what Wynn does in that book, which is really very interesting, he poses a lot of new, or well, you know, security theory based on, on, on old paradigms, stuff that we already knew from the engineering age, and um, his engineering background informed that, that book uh, to a great uh, degree. And there's stuff in there that we are simply not doing right now in the security industry that I feel uh, that we should. So, um, you know, that's just a bit of background for those of you who haven't read his book. I can highly recommend it. It's really awesome. It's a nice read. It's very graphically represented as well. Um, not, a, not a boring, great tone, uh, but very visual. Um, uh, by the way, we still have like 160 participants. So you kept people up, my friend. Uh, I, I mean, our Q and A is just overflowing, as you've noticed. We're getting to learn about this platform. Are there any questions for Win? If not, um, we're going to close because I'm seeing something going on. I can, I can't, I can't keep up. Uh, just getting a lot of very positive feedback from people about your talk. And um, so far, which has been great. Aryan, are you still around? Because I see a lot of comment from you. Coming. Maybe you want to switch in and, and talk as well. We got some time at least. We're in overtime already. That was just an open Um I'm sure people will find you with. <laughs> We need to get get a hold of this platform. We have one question on the on the on the end here by uh, Peter Davidson. Where is the human in cyborg life? That's a really say that again. Repeat that again. There was a slight breakup. Where is the human in cyborg life? I don't know if you're trying to hearken. I'm not sure I understand. Where is? Yeah. It's a bit of a vague question. Can you elaborate, Peter? I'm not sure. Where are cyborgs and humans in life? I'm not sure I understand what that means. Well, you can interpret the question in multiple ways. That's why I'm asking. You mean like what's real today? As do, as do Peter's dream of electronic sheep? It's kind of like that, yeah. Peter, that's not helping. Rephrase your question and make it completely understandable for someone who doesn't know what's in your head, mate. <laughs> I, I, I can't translate this. I mean, I could go on my why AI, why AI is in real rant, but I'm not sure that's where he's going with the question. Yeah, yeah. He says, let me answer that your question really it doesn't work, and Wynn is agreeing. So please rephrase it, otherwise we're going to have to close the evening. I'll give you a few more seconds to type it out. Oh, here's a question. Um, analog network security physically. We've had problems with Europe. It's all your fault, clearly. Of course. Of course. Because we're not allowed to ship COVID books over there. Any No. Um, the physical book has been out uh, for just, I guess, two years now. And because of COVID and all sorts of other reasons, I'm trying to – make sure that if we do an electronic version of it, that uh, the quality is going to translate properly because there are 3,000 graphics in it, and that there are some DMAs. I don't know how it will work on a Kindle or other e-book, so I don't know yet, but we're playing with that, and I've got my graphics. You know, Kaylee, I've got my graphics folks working on that to uh, try to help me make a final decision to make it electronic. Because it doesn't translate to something really small right now. 
Uh, okay, so we got to rephrase the question, and this I think this is better. How can we maintain human or humane life and decision making in a far more complex technolo technological level of society? That's a good question. One of the things I've always been very critical about, well, I shouldn't say always, when I woke up to this realization that uh, when we get when users get a manual on a new piece of tech and it's written by an Asian uh, engineer who was the designer and he wrote the user manual, no offense to anybody, but usually that sucks because they're not supposed to be writing the manuals. When we've been designing technology since, and I use 1952 arbitrarily because of when the hard disk was introduced, um, engineers, have been designing for engineers, a lot less so than for users. And we see this, uh, I thought the comment earlier, maybe Richard made it, uh, geez, well, I mean, if I, this thing is just too damn hard to use. And we have been battling this. We've been designing, uh, we've been designing technology to try to get people to become more thinking and behaving silicon binary-ish. And that is the opposite of what we are. We should be designing stuff the other way around. And when we start removing binary thinking uh, from uh, the way that we approach the interface uh, of technology and humans, uh, a lot more subtle answers begin to appear. And I think that part of the problem of this uh, decision making is that we try to still be absolute about it, and I have become absolutely convinced that there is absolutely no such thing as absolutism. <laughs> That's like a, a full pause right here. <laughs> no such thing as absolutism. Okay. Absolutely not. Absolutely. So is that absolutely no absolutism. All power, all power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Because I had a corollary, and it said all power corrupts, and absolute power is even more fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's from the Battle Operator from Hell, Simon Travaglia. If you have never read his stuff, you should. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, we, we got some more questions coming in. I'll pipe them through you for uh, another few minutes, but we really do have to uh, wrap up. Uh, Wynn, my brother, thank you so much. I love you thank being you. here. Thank you for your time. Um, Soon come, hopefully we're going to cut off the audience in a few moments so that we can just have a, a, a like an, an after conference chat briefly with the group for everyone who's still here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of the evening. A win. Thank you, my brother. Uh, people thank you. looking at this conference, I thank you for coming. This has been a really brilliant night. It's gone beyond my expectations and my fears. Outstanding. Um, and I hope to see you all in the next event and hopefully back into the deep space in a, some obscure military base somewhere where we can just have a drink afterwards and talk. So thank you for being here, guys, and thank you, speakers, for your delicate time. It has been awesome. And uh, let's wrap this up. Goodbye, everyone. Have a nice evening.